Good morning and welcome to Navigation Church. If you're joining us online, we're so happy you decided to stop in in the digital world and check us out um, and get to know a little bit more about what our current Proverbs series is laying out for us when it comes to living and walking in the way of the wise versus the way of the fool. And just to give you some context, you're like, well, that's that guy, he gets up there and he sings sometimes, or that's that guy, he gets up and does the announcements, and then he tells the people to pass the bags, and he tells us, I, yeah, I've done all those things, but I'm coming here to t talk to you for about the next 40 minutes about creating lasting wisdom. Because as we're looking at our conversation on wisdom, I, I realize that there's amazing things that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that when it comes to uh, Dallas's conversation last week, we are starting taking that single step, that single thought, that single word in our initial step on the straight path. But the obvious question is, how do we maintain? How do we create wisdom that lasts a lifetime? One of the capacities I serve in here at Navigation Church is the generational pastor. And why I love wearing that hat is because we are uh, committed to uh, course coordinating and connecting every generation along their journey and helping them discover their next step in a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And why I love that is because there is truth that with age, there is wisdom. And I love that I can bring the wisdom of age and the energy of youth and bring them together to realize that we are on this faith journey together as Navigation Church going along the way that he's called us to. And there has to be a synergy of our generations. There has to be that understanding that what the father says to the son matters and what the father lays out for the son matters. And it has to be applied to our life like we learned last week in order to be the wisdom to lead us on the way of the wise. And so in my life, I have realized that one of the roles I can't wait to fulfill, but I'm not yet filled, is the role of a father. I love the fact that one day I will get to be responsible. I, right now, I'm excited about it. At some point, I promise I'll be like, I am responsible for this. I was talking to somebody the other day uh, about their student, and they're like, well, they're about this age, which means I have this many years to get it right before they go to college. And I said, well, let's just take the pressure off and live life moment by moment, wise decision by wise decision by wise decision. And so that's the passion that's on the inside of me. But knowing that I desire to be a father means I'm going to practice right now so that when that day comes, I'm prepared. So one of the ways I practice is with our student ministry. I get to hang out with them every Sunday night and sometimes uh, discipling them, fathering them, training up in, in the way they should go sounds something like this. At this age, you use deodorant. Leading up to our summer trip, I need you to grasp this spiritual truth that at this age, we use deodorant. Or sometimes it's conversations with Taylor's story that we just heard of realizing there are students, there are young people in this age where they're making that transition from this is who mom and dad's God is, this is who grandma's God is, this is who my, my parent was, their God was, to discovering who their God is. And in discovering who their God is, they discover who their identity is. And if any one of those steps is missed or not seized, it actually can create an identity crisis. It can lead to social anxiety. It can lead to suicidal thoughts. It can lead to addictions because students, people in general, will go to wherever they feel like they can find life, right? So in our life, where are we going to find life? And so I get to practice being a father and leading those sons and daughters to find life from deodorant to anxiety. It's a gamut, and so is parenting. Can we be, can we be real? It is. But then one of my other favorite spots uh, to practice being a father is with my nieces and nephews. And this is kind of like the perks of being a grandparent. You get to get them sugared up, have all the fun, get all the energy started, and then leave. And it's a great moment, it's a great time, but there was an uh, instance where I was just kind of hanging out in the backyard with some of my nephews and playing with them, and the power of the moment hit me. That yeah, we were playing, but then I had this thought cross my mind. How did they know me? How will they remember me? 
So letting that truth of that moment sink in, it led me into this conversation that we're going to have today, that when we jump into Proverbs 3, Proverbs is a book composed by fathers' writings to their sons, and one of those is King Lemuel. This is a fun fact that I discovered in my studies, that he actually composed the works of his mother's advice into what we now know as the Proverbs 31 woman. That he took the words of his mother in order to make sure, women, you know what it means to be a woman of God. And you have fathers that are saying, sons, I, want, I don't want you to miss that. That's why throughout all of Proverbs, you'll see this common phrase, my sons, my sons. There is a generational motivation that comes when you realize, whether it's me in the backyard, how will they know me? How will they remember me? How will I create lasting impact in their own life? You can sense the same urgency as these fathers are giving the words to us that say, my sons, don't miss this. And so we actually see in Proverbs 3, 1 through 4, that urgency come across when it says, my son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Can you hear that urgency? Like, don't miss this. Put it in front of you all the days of your life. Hang it around your neck if you have to. Write it on the tablet of your heart so yet you can't erase that. It's etched into who you are. But right in there, I want to ask this question of parents, or if I can even expand it to say this, mentors. If you've had children in your life or people that you've spoken into their life, you have a desire and a drive to instill and impart wisdom to them. You want them to heed your words so that they don't have to repeat the same painful personal process that you went through in order to gain that wisdom. I can see that in Solomon's words. I can see that in the words of scripture of that generational sons and daughters of God. We must get this because that drive is you don't want them to make the same mistakes as you. How many, every parent in the room would say that. But how many of you would say the, the children that you've had, the mentors that you've had in your life, they have taken 100% of every wise word you shared with them and immediately applied it to their life in the moment? There's an the answer. I'll take the laugh as an amen. But also, can we ask it this way? How many of you as parents or mentors would wish for your child or person you're speaking into their life that they would only learn through pains of personal process? Absolutely not. So while as parents and while as mentors alike, we have a desire to instill and impart this wisdom and that they would heed it and know it, they are going to learn through the pains of their personal processes, but they will also heed your wise words. The decision is, are they going to have that in their life? Are they going to surround themselves in order to create a lasting wisdom? Because it's, it's, it's true uh, in some regards when the expression says, wisdom comes from experience, but not exclusively. And wise words heeded can help you avoid the pain of a personal process. Both are true. So both should be instilled in, in our, our youth. Both should be instilled in ourselves as sons and daughters of God because oftentimes we, we don't miss this. Or maybe you're in here and you feel like I've, I've gone so far down the way of the fool, I can't imagine getting back to the way of the wise. It's with one simple decision to refocus. But you realize your children your ment the people you are mentoring, they will be shaped just like you through the wise words he did and the pains of personal process. But as I look at Proverbs and uh, the rest of the remaining verses that we'll get into out of chapter three here, I see a three-step pattern by which we can live by and build by in the moment ahead of our journey, or if we find ourselves on the way of the fool, it's still truths, still wisdom that we can harvest through the pains of our personal process. So whatever 
step you are on in your personal journey, this message is for you because we are all as sons and daughters called to create lasting wisdom. And so there are three simple steps that uh, provide the frame for, framework for how we create lasting wisdom. The first is this, we trust in the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7 says this, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. I love that as we kind of work backwards out of that passage, we get a review of our past two weeks because if we look at verse 7, it says, Fear the Lord and shun evil. That takes me back to the, the realization that Pastor Brent brought two weeks ago that we need to come and we need to have a fear and a reverence and an awe for who God is so that might we see and know this is the way of the wise because if he has said it, I will listen. And if we work back into verse six, in all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. That's what Dallas talked to us about, about starting that straight path with a single step, a, a single thought, a single word. That's how we can begin to initiate this process is by taking a single step after we acknowledge and we fear the Lord. And finally, we get to the body of what we're gonna talk about in point one of verse five. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Right there, we see the opposing option to trusting in the Lord is to lean on our own understanding and be wise in our own eyes. If I could say it this way, the opposing option to trusting in the Lord is our own pride. That at the core of who we are, to not say yes to him, to not place our trust in him is actually to come to this place of self-trust or I could say it this way, self-preservation. Because we're saying this ultimately, I can do this on my own. That's just foolish thinking. I love you enough to say that is stupid thinking. The way of the wise acknowledges, I think this guy, he, he kind of created the universe. He, everything that was, is, is, because of him, why do I think I should do anything other than listen to him? <laughs> I haven't created many universes lately. <laughs> yeah, my track record in like God qualities. So there is no pride that I can bring to the table, but only humility. But as we trust the Lord, we have to realize what stands out to me also is the word all. If we look at this passage, again, it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and in all of your ways, submit to him. Partial wisdom won't cut it because it creates an opening for foolishness to creep in. Right there in our moment, how many places in our life are we struggling to truly trust in God? I can say I trust in God. Most, everybody in this room could probably raise your hand and say, yes, I trust in the Lord. But do you trust in the Lord with all your heart? Do you trust in the Lord with all your ways? Or are there places of our life where our pride just wants to self-protect? Our self-trust wants to elevate itself. And I could say it this way, self-prevention becomes our norm. And it could be that the place that we let self-trust, self-preservation creep in is the main place of foolishness in our life that continues to be a stumbling block over and over and over that continues to tr uh, trip us up moment after moment along this path because we haven't submitted, we haven't humbled ourselves to the truth of that we can trust in him. I just want to tell you this, that Say this word with me, backstory. So we love that, man, Solomon was the wisest guy. He wrote these words for his sons to hear, but what inspired them? What drove him to say this? Is this some wise words that he heeded on his own? Or these were wisdom that he harvested through the pain of his personal process? Well, if we actually go back to 1 Kings uh, in chapter 11, we, we read that Solomon's heart was actually turned after other gods at a time in his life. 
And his heart, listen to this, was not fully devoted to God as his father David's was. And Solomon did, Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord because he did not follow the Lord completely. Complete trust. So this same guy who struggled on the way and who was harvesting the truth of, man, I really messed up royally. He was a king. It works. He messed up in this moment, yet he didn't let the single moment of his foolishness define him. He allowed a pivot to happen. And so now can you read that verse a little bit different when he's speaking to his sons, when he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I've seen what it costs me in all my ways. Son, listen, submit to him because he will make your path straight. I wandered, but he'll keep your path straight because don't be wise in your own eyes. I thought I knew I had it all together. Somewhere along the way of thinking I was the wisest guy to walk the earth, I lost the sight of the one who was my source. Can I add this? Your foolishness doesn't just cost you. It costs those around you. It will cost some aspects of the relationship with your spouse, with your children, with your children's children, because you see the, the punishment that comes to Solomon is that the Lord says, I am going to split your kingdom in two. And then what did he say after that? He said, but I won't do it in your lifetime. I will do it in your sons. Your decisions today define your destiny tomorrow. So in the middle of this moment, can you come to a place of trust? Because I would rather trust in him and have confidence that those who come after me will still regard him as worthy, as holy, as mighty, as awesome, rather than saying I'm going to self-trust here and maybe, just maybe, it won't happen in my lifetime, but it may just cost my children. Can we stand on the walls for our family and choose to trust in the Lord? What are those things that are holding that back? What is the place in your life where you're choosing self-trust versus trusting in the Lord? I don't want to see you make foolishness because I can sense the Father's heart in what he desires for you and for your children. And that is for you to thrive in a life characterized by wisdom. Because what foolishness you tolerate today, your children will regard as normal tomorrow. As Pastor David said a couple of weeks, it, we will be, our next generation will be lax in our disciplines and regard our, our foolishness as normal. That is what we have. That is what, that's the promise that's out there if we don't seize this element of trusting in the Lord. But maybe you're here today and you're like, why should I even trust in him? Why should I even embrace him? Why should I even pursue him? I'm saying you are called to trust him because he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you could ask or imagine. Remember what I said his track record was? He created the universe. He numbers the stars. He holds the sand in his hand. He has this. His ability is you can't put, define it. So why, why wouldn't we trust him? Because he is able. He is able. He is able. So where do you need to begin trusting God? What is your first step? As I look at my own personal life and places where I have struggled, I've realized in the place where I need to build trust, I first need to discover the truth that he speaks to me. What I mean by that is the reality is that, remember how I said earlier, by, everything, by his word, everything was made that was made. Everything that is, is because of him. He breathed life into you. He formed you out of the dirt. He numbered your days. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows your DNA. He knows every detail about you. So why wouldn't we trust him? Why wouldn't we draw close to him? Why wouldn't we have a moment to trust in him? Because our first step is the same word, that same voice that calls you to life. It's the same voice. It's the same word that can reach you where you're at today and give you a truth 
to begin building your trust. In your own relationships, how many of your relationships have been severed, have, have suffered a breakdown when trust was broken? Why? Because deceit or a lie creeped in. But your strongest relationships are those where truth has always been at the center. Love has always been the focus. Apply that to your relationship with God. When you feel a breakdown, seek his truth. Some practicals of seeking his truth is just to get in his word. We sang a song, I am who you say I am, but do you believe that this morning? If you're here this morning and you struggle with fear, do you realize his word says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind? Do you realize his word also says that he who dwells in the secret place of the most high will abide under the shadow of the almighty? He is my refuge, my fortress in him. I put my trust. That's just with fear. If you feel like you're coming today and you feel like your self-defense is always have to be up because you don't know who's gonna be the next person to hurt you, if God before you, who can be against you? What truth do you need to take a hold of today, church? If you're here today and you feel like you're struggling, struggling with doubt, why are you downcast, oh my soul? Hope in God. Some of you just need to begin to speak to yourself the truth that his word already says about you. That you are ahead and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. You are called. We sang it in another song. We're coming back to a place of worship. I am blessed. I am whole. I am healed. I am blessed. I am whole. I am healed. Highly favored. Anointed. Filled with your power. So why then should I be afraid? Why then should I suffer with doubt? Why should I have to put my self-defenses up because I set my worship in its rightful place? Foolishness is your prison. But where is your praise? Foolishness will incarcerate you, but wisdom will emancipate you. The truth of his word, that he who the son sets free is free indeed. So I'm wondering if there's somebody this morning that you, in order to build your trust, you need to start by building him up in your worship. I'm wondering if there's somebody in this room this morning that has a place where you have, I have this challenge, I have this issue, I have this problem, and you're presenting them to God where you need to take your God and present him into your your problems, your issues, and your challenges, and see if he can't take care of it. Where is your worship? We start by trusting in the Lord. But this passage we just read and studied out of finishes with this. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. As that pride begins to creep up, can I offer you the antidote? Can I op offer you option two? We'll place your pride with humility. Make a habit of being humble. And one of the best ways we are humbled is through step two, discipline. We have to embrace the discipline that God brings in order to humble ourselves, in order to fully trust him, in order to fully realize the wisdom that he has for us. Because Proverbs 3, 11 through 12 says this, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord dis disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. I love that Hebrews goes on to quote this passage, but then offers this further promise from it that starting in Hebrews 12, verse 10, our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. Anybody else have that experience? Thanks, dad. Yet God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, amen, but painful. However, later on, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. There is a lesson in your discipline. There is a truth that you can harvest in your personal experience. But I want to encourage you today to take off the negative stigma of discipline and embrace the regard as a disciple of Jesus. 
that in order to become more like Christ, there are things that I need to shed. There are behaviors that I need to get rid of. There are people in my life that need to be separated from me because there is a God who wants to shape me, cut me at times to sever this foolishness out of my life so that I can begin to pursue wisdom wholeheartedly, pursue him wholeheartedly. But I want to ask you today is maybe the discipline in your life, maybe you can identify, especially if you're starting this journey with Christ for the first time, those who you surround yourself with are oftentimes the most wise or foolish decision you can make. Because have you surrounded yourself with people who will encourage your negative behavior, encourage your dysfunction, encourage you to have that bad habit, bad habit, bad habit? Or will you surround yourself with with men and women of accountability, those who have gone forth before you, whose words of wisdom you can heed and apply to your own life and begin to no longer struggle on the way of the fool, but walk in the way of the wise? Can you... Begin to do that. Can you cut those people out of your life? Because you realize he loves those he disciplines. They don't just put that in there for fluff. He does this because he loves you. As a parent, if you ever had a kid running towards an outlet with a fork, I don't know why your kid has a fork in the first place, but you're running towards the outlet with a fork and you're like, no, 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 you smack the hand, you pull the the fork out of their hand, you're like, wow, that was so mean. How dare you discipline your child? That sounds ignorant, right? That sounds foolish. Yet sometimes how often is that our response to when God says, don't do that anymore. Don't go there. Don't speak that. Don't watch that. Don't experience that. Don't smoke that. Don't think that. Whatever it is, it was he wanting to sever it because he cares about you. And it seems like, oh, I don't want to suffer the loss. But can I tell you this? What is there to gain? When I stop making discipline, if when I stop taking discipline personally and make it personal, everything changes. When I realize, when I'm taking it personally, when you're taking uh, discipline personally, can I tell you this? This is a key indicator that pride is creeping its head up. But when you can make it personal and you say, if choosing this costs me a relationship with you, God, I don't want it. If choosing this behavior costs me a relationship with my spouse, with my kids, with my coworkers, I don't want any part of it, but I want all of you because when we make discipline from taking it personally to making it personal, we take it off the focus of the action and focus on the aspect of the relationship that matters. So in that place, can you come with me today? Can you trust in the Lord and can you embrace discipline? And somebody needs to hear this today. Don't view punishment as punishment. Maybe you need to look at discipline as preparation. As parents, you always set out to do your best because at some point I was speaking with a a parent of a student who has about six years before they graduate high school. And I was sitting at the table and they're like, I have six years to get this right i.e. their child, before they go off to college. So that parent realizes the importance of the preparation that needs to happen for that child before that college transition happens, before the new weight of responsibility, the new weight of their calling for that season comes. Don't be angry at God when you're saying, God, you're punishing me because I know you promised this to me, and why is it not happening? Because you said it five minutes ago, but yet God is saying, you're five years from it. Yet in there, that's love. In that moment, there's hope. In there, there is a father who says, if I dropped the call I have for you on you right now, you would crumble. But can I work on your pride? Can I develop your humility so that when that day comes, you can receive it as a faithful son? And I acknowledged two groups earlier that there are maybe those that are just starting on your journey and you're ready just to heed whatever wise word that somebody will say to you this morning, great. But if you're somebody in here this morning and you feel like you're caught on the way of the fool and you can't get out, can I tell you there is an option out. 
There is a way out. You can, in the middle of this moment, begin to harvest and embrace the discipline that it has because even if you don't heed it, the word promises that he will still chase you. He loves those he disciplines. And by the way, you need to also hear this of who's, who's disciplining you. Sometimes it is God disciplining you. He, he, he's prepping you. He's preparing you. Sometimes there's people in your life that you're like, oh, he's preparing me. He's teaching me disciplines here. But I'd like to argue there's one more group that disciplines you along the way of the fool. You. How many are on that place and he's not gonna use himself. You're doing a great job enough teaching yourself the lesson. And if I could make this kind of, make light in this way, it's like you're just going there and doing that same thing and it's damaging for your life. It hurts you. It's not beneficial for you. It's not anything that's gonna get you anywhere closer. And you're like, quit hitting yourself. Sometimes the major revelation isn't that God has to say it through the word. Sometimes the major revelation isn't that your parents or somebody who speaks into your life or mentors you has to say it. Sometimes you just have to look at yourself in the mirror and says, I'm a mess. Yet, God can come in in a moment and shape you. Because he's like, you're a mess? I can make a message out of that. That's my business. So are you in this place where you can trust the Lord? Are you in this place where you can embrace the discipline? Because as you're going through your life, yes, wisdom starts by a single step onto the straight path. But life's a journey, a series of steps. So how do we maintain? How do we create lasting wisdom? Well, the third and final thing we have to do is we have to keep our focus. Proverbs 3, 21 through 26 says this, My son, do not let wisdom and understanding out of your sight preserve sound judgment and discretion. They will be life for you, an ornament to grace your neck. Then you will go on your way in safety and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Have no fear of sudden disaster or the ruin that overtakes the wicked for the Lord will be at your side and he will keep your foot from being snared. You see, with the fear of the Lord, we establish our trust. You see, with going on the straight path, we initiate the disciplines that we need to begin exercising in our life. But as we come to keeping our focus, that's how we keep our path. That's how we maintain is that we set our eyes on the one thing that changes everything. Because you will come to different levels of wisdom in your life. It happens in your everyday life. You had to learn addition and subtraction or just the basic concepts of numbers before you could move on to multiplication and division and onto that calculus stuff, which I have not committed to memory since college. But where are the stages of life that you need to be continuing to keep your focus? Because are you stuck with adding and subtraction when he desires to give you calculus? Set your focus on the one thing that changes everything. Another practical example beyond math, because I don't like math, um, but I love my wife. So I'll talk about my wife for a second. But to those in the room that are married, and this is some preparation for those in the room that are not yet married, on your wedding day, I guarantee at least once, you said three little words. I love you. Right? I hope. <laughs> Sorry. I love you. But do you know how unhealthy it is to say one and done? I said it once, she should know. I said it once, he should know. But what is the benefit when you continue to discover new levels of love for your spouse? I love you because you came in and you transformed my life. I love you because you didn't give up on me when I burnt dinner. I love you because you didn't get angry at me when I forgot to pick you up. I love you because you're just you. I love you because you just love me. 
I love you. We're on this path as we set our focus on my relationship with my wife. I'm consistently discovering new levels of love for my wife. As you're in your relationship with God, are you consistently discovering new levels of him? Are you consistently discovering new levels of the wisdom he has for your life when you set your focus on him? Remember, you have to crush your pride and embrace humility. Because creating lasting wisdom is a life cycle and a lifestyle. We've given our three things. We have to trust in the Lord, embrace discipline, and keep your focus. When you get to keep your focus, you're not done. Because when you get there, you're like, oh my gosh, I need to learn another way to trust him. I need to trust, I need to embrace, I need to focus. I need to trust, I need to embrace, I need to focus. In this aspect of my life where everything seems to be falling apart, I need to trust, I need to embrace, I need to focus in order to receive and create lasting wisdom for my life. Just want to do some very practical Proverbs here in order to demonstrate this cycle and what it can mean for you. Because remember Proverbs, uh, Pastor David laid out Different ones will apply to different aspects of your life. But when Proverbs 10.4 says, lazy hands make a man poor, but diligent hands bring wealth, is there a place in your life where you've kind of just defaulted to a norm, but God's calling maybe to a business venture? And you want to keep lazy. You want to keep your normal because it's what you know. It's what you self-trust. But he's wanting you to step out. He's wanting you to exert yourself. He's wanting you to be diligent in a new venture and take a step in that way so that you can embrace and set your focus on the new day ahead instead of being stuck in your current day. Proverbs 10, 9, the man of integrity walks securely, but he who takes crooked paths will be found. Do you want to be the person at work that it doesn't matter if your coworkers and your boss is saying it will profit us, but it will cost you your integrity? Are you willing to say, I will trust God and I will side with my integrity versus siding with their profit margin? Will you trust him in that place and embrace the discipline that may come and the way it challenges your pride and it may challenge, it may challenge you in the way that it costs you a promotion, but it won't cost you your integrity. God will see that and he will honor you and he will help keep you focused on your straight path. Proverbs 1025 says, when the storm has swept by, the wicked are gone, but the righteous stand firm forever. I'm wondering if there's somebody in this room where you feel like you're going through a storm of your life, and you're like, I don't know if I can stand it. Promise here, when the storm has swept by. The wicked are gone, but the righteous stand firm. Keep your focus upon him. Embrace the discipline that needs to come and keep your focus so that when this storm passes, you are still standing versus when this storm passes, you're like, where did it go wrong? Maybe you're in that spot. Or maybe you're in that place this morning where you need to hear this. The final one is Proverbs 10, 16. The wages of the righteous is life, but the earnings of the wicked are sin and death. You might be in here today and you're like, you said some things that I would agree with, but I don't understand when you say I'm his son or daughter. I don't understand when you say I'm a child of God. Like, what does he have to do with me? He kind of just spun things into order and I'm just here, right? No, I want to push a little bit further. I want to say, are you here in your life? Is your life producing life or is your life producing death? When you look around, is your life developing you or is your life destroying you? Or maybe you're here today and you just want to be called son. You just want to be called daughter so that you might know that the righteous is life. I don't want to be found in the company of the wicked knowing the inheritance that is sin and death. I want to know righteousness. I want to know life. I want to know you, God. Are you in that place today? 
If you would, in order to encourage those people to respond, could everybody just bow their heads and close their eyes? If you're here this morning and you're ready to respond to a father who's calling you son, a father who's calling you daughter, and you want to be adopted into this, like you have gone through your life and you've trusted so many different things, can I encourage you, trust him. And you've experienced in your life negative discipline, but can I offer you one who comes to discipline you because he loves you and his discipline doesn't leave destruction in his path, but it leads to life. You're here this morning and you want to respond to that. You want that. You want that relationship. I just want to encourage you with every head bowed and every eye closed, just simply to raise your hand. To say, yeah, that's what I want. Yes, that's what I want to experience. See that hand. Thank you, Jesus. In order to make them comfortable, if you would all just repeat after me, Dear Heavenly Father, I am your son. I am your daughter. Because your son died for me. Your love was shown for me through his sacrifice. So today, I can say, I am yours. Father, I just thank you for the people that have prayed that for the first time. I join with all of heaven in celebrating the good work that you have started in them today. I celebrate with them that they are on the path to find their worship and find you and discover their trust to begin to cut away the things that no longer lead to life, but begin running after you in all that they do on the straight path that they joined today. But Father, likewise, for every other person in this room, we do realize that we are in this lifestyle, this life cycle of creating lasting wisdom. But God, let us not grow weary in trusting you. Let us not grow weary when it seems the hand's just a little too heavy this time. When the discipline comes, God, let us renew our minds to realize what I have to gain is you. So that all the days of my life, we may seek you, know you, know wisdom, and know the way of the wise. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Amen.